Hello. In this video, I'm going to explain the hormones of the menstrual cycle. Just by way of introduction, I'm Liam. I'm a male biology teacher. I have no personal experience of this cycle. I'm just going to explain how the hormones work. And uh, about half the audience watching this will have a better practical knowledge of how it works than me. And so there are four hormones which control the menstrual cycle, which makes it um, a little complicated uh, compared to some of the other hormonally controlled um, aspects that we find in the body, like the control of water balance, for example, which only has one hormone to control the ADH or control the blood glucose, which is controlled by two main hormones. The menstrual cycle has four. And those four hormones are estrogen, and progesterone. And also two other hormones called LH, which stands for luteinizing hormone, and FSH, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone. And the two hormones come from two different locations in the body. And those locations are these two hormones, estrogen and progesterone, they come from the ovary. And the LH and the FSH, they come from the pituitary gland. Which is uh, near your brain. And not only do they come from different places, they're also quite different in what they control. So estrogen and progesterone contain, control the uterus lining. So the thickness of it and the development of it. And LH and FSH, they control ovulation and follicle development. So you can see already that there are four hormones, but they have um, different target organs. So just to summarize before I move on to quite an interesting graph, estrogen and progesterone come from the ovary and control the uterus lining. LH and FSH come from the pituitary and they control ovulation and follicle development. Time for some coffee. You can pause this video at any point and um, that'll help you to take notes. But there's the hormones. So what's interesting about these hormones is how they change over time. And if we were to draw a graph over time where this is zero days and this is 28 days, and just a caveat on this, um, 28 days is the textbook length of a menstrual cycle. Um, obviously not all females are textbook and they'll have different length cycles, but this is, um, I even hesitate to say that it is typical, but this is, um, let's say an average. Um, and halfway between 28 and, four, and 0 and 28 would be 14. And then one more uh, number of days I'm going to add on that timeline is uh, 5. So you've got 0 to 5 days, 5 to 14 days, then 14 to 28 days. Up the side of our graph, we're going to put hormone levels. And these are relative hormone levels. of the four hormones that we've just discussed. And at the bottom of our graph, we're gonna put events. We'll see what's happening to the uterus. And also what's happening to our egg cell. So, we'll get the events uh, done first actually between zero and five days what you've got is you've got menstruation and that's when the uterus lining 
um, actually leaves the body of the female uh, via the vagina. And it's what's known as a period in, in common terms. So that's between zero and five days. And as I've already said about the length of the whole cycle, I totally realize that it may not be between zero and five days for some uh, females. The next thing that happens to the uterus lining is you get repair and regrowth after uh, menstruation. And the thing that happens after this day 14 is you get maintenance of it. Of the uterus lining um, following uh, ovulation and just under that what's happening to the egg cell is on day 14 you get ovulation at the risk of repeating myself it's around uh, the middle of the cycle day 14 and and to be fair research suggests that the days between 0 and 14 are fairly constant uh, among females but the days between 0 and 28 or 21 and 35 uh, that's that shows greater variation so you've got ovulation which happens in in day 14 and then here uh, in between uh, day zero and ovulation you've got follicle development and on the other side of ovulation you've got something called the corpus luteum, which is the point in the ovary where that egg was released. And it's Latin, and it means body, and this means yellow. I'm um, assuming somebody looked at it, um, probably under a microscope or after a dissection, and it looked a bit yellow, so maybe that's how it's got its name. Um, so, these are the the events so we've got the uterus um actually leaving the body of the female and menstruation then you've got repair of the uterus line and then maintenance and then you've got the egg developing and then being released from the ovary into the oviduct and then after that the bit which is left over has some hormonal function which is the corpus luteum and this is what happens to those four hormones that we talked about most straightforward one we'll do first LH is called luteinizing hormone and there's not much of it released and then pretty much bang on ovulation you get a spike of it and then it goes back to normal again and hardly any of it's released. So that's the LH curve. And so it's pretty obvious what LH does. LH causes ovulation. You can see the event uh, follows the hormone uh, very closely there. And the other hormone from the pituitary gland is follicle stimulating hormone. It does something like this. It starts to rise there, peaks in the first half of the cycle. And there's another little peak just there. And it pretty much falls off second half of the cycle until, until the cycle starts again. And that is, um, that's what happens to follicle stimulating hormone. Uh, so we'll put uh, FSH here, follicle stimulating hormone, our blue line. Then you've got those two hormones, they control what is happening to the egg cell. And then the hormones that control the uterus, you've got estrogen here, peaks here, goes down, back up a bit and then falls again. Um, and the primary function of estrogen in the menstrual cycle, it also causes secondary sexual characteristics in females at puberty, but the function of it in the menstrual cycle is it causes repair of the uterus line and following menstruation. And then you've got a rather important a hormone which does something like this. It's low in the first half of the cycle, goes up and then falls. And the fall there is quite sharp. So it goes back down to its, um, its level there quite sharply at the end of the menstrual cycle. And that's progesterone. And that 
causes maintenance of the uterus lining after ovulation. So that means that if the egg was to be fertilized, the uterus lining will be there, it could implant in that, and at that point of implantation, it could form a placenta. Uh, and that fall in progesterone, that's what causes uh, the onset of menstruation, and then the cycle starts again. So that is how the hormones work. And I hope you can see the point of this graph is if you've got the hormone levels and the events, you should be able to relate the hormone levels to the events. So FSCH, peak is here, causes follicle development. The clue's in the name, it's called follicle stimulating hormone, causes follicle development. Estrogen causes repair of the uterus lining after menstruation. LH causes ovulation, progesterone, causes maintenance of the uterus lining after ovulation and a fall in progesterone, uh, that's what causes the onset of menstruation. If you want to try and get that graph, uh, you can. You can pause the video. Oh, he's good. So the next thing that we need to have a look at is how those hormones interact with each other. This is quite an important example of uh, negative feedback. And we'll, we'll use this again. So here we have our four hormones back, right? And we're interested in them here. How they interact with each other, okay? So, We'll use a key. What's interesting is <clears throat> that there's stimulation and inhibition going on here. The relationship between uh, estrogen and follicle stimulating hormone is interesting because estrogen inhibits follicle stimulating hormone. So that's the key that I'm going to use for inhibit. So it's like an arrow with a cross on it. inhibition and FSH actually stimulates estrogen release and that is the key I'm going to use for that stimulation with double arrow So here you've got FSH stimulates estrogen, but then estrogen inhibits FSH, which means you've got a negative feedback loop going on there. So if FSH um, is causing estrogen release, that estrogen gets released and stops the release of FSH. So it's like a, a form of a regulation. Uh, progesterone, interestingly, inhibits both FSH and it inhibits LH. Um, so you don't release LH in between uh, 14 and 28 days in the cycle. Um, and that's why progesterone is very useful as a contraceptive, whatever method of um, sort of ingestion you use. So you can eat uh, progesterone in a pill and that will help prevent pregnancy. Uh, you can have it injected or have it diffuse out of, a, of an implant. Um, and that's why it works. And it's a, a method of birth control that's been around um, since the 1960s. Because it inhibits these two hormones, uh, that means that you don't get follicle development um, if you can get the dosage of progesterone correct. And other things that are, that are going on, estrogen also, um, it stimulates the release of luteinizing hormone. And it sort of makes sense. Because if you've got, if the estrogen's high, if you were to scroll back in the video and have a look at your graph again, or if you've, if you've drawn the graph and you have a look, have a look at it now, uh, estrogen peak comes before the LH peak. So it would follow that estrogen stimulates um, LH release 
Um, while progesterone is high, the levels of these two hormones, LH and FSH, that's low. So then it follows that progesterone would inhibit LH and FSH. Um, that's all for now. Uh, I hope you found it interesting and informative. I do will repeat what I said at the start. I know that I might never have experienced this, but hopefully at least I've communicated how these hormones um, work together to control the menstrual cycle. Thanks for watching.